Okay, please open your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And this is day four of our second trip to London this year. And it's been a great outreach thus far. Every morning we are outside Euston train station, giving out tracks, speaking to people. And after our morning presence, we come home, have some breakfast, have a reading such as this. And then we go out for the day. And it's been a great blessing. And it continues to be a great blessing, great fellowship, and great food as well. Yesterday we were at Speaker's Corner, a very interesting place to visit, a very unique place to visit, and my initial thoughts from yesterday would be number one, where are the Christians, which is what I thought back in June. Number two, how could it be possible that the Muslims have pretty much dominated it? And I mean male Muslims from the Middle East, from Bangladesh, Pakistan, and probably India and the truth be known it's all they've ever known they've been born in Islam they've been raised in Islam and they probably work in their mosque planning strategy they go out like a wolf pack much like the German U-boats did back in World War II they went out on the prowl to destroy you to devour you and the cults do this they have role play and they plan their strategy and they train up their people to go out onto the streets and pretty much defend their way of belief, their system, which is fair enough. But the JWs are pretty good at doing this, the Mormons are pretty good at doing this, but the Muslims have really perfected it. And I take my hat off to them, because they know what they're talking about, and yet at the same time they are dead from the neck up. They are victims of their own religion. They are part of a system which cannot save them. And they're very proud of their religion, but of course you know that Satan fell as a result of pride, and therefore their pride will one day be turned against them. It'll be uh, very much used against them, and they'll be forced to capitulate. They will be very much aware of the great white throne judgment, that their pride in their religion, and their pride in their so-called prophets, and their so-called God will be all in vain. As far as I'm concerned, we had great news for those that were at Speaker's Corner yes yesterday. We got our banner up, gave out tracks, and for three hours, the light of Christ, the light of Scripture, shone in a very dark place. And I'll say this one more time, where were the churches? I can think of three PhDs in the London area that were nowhere to be seen. And as Patrick quite rightly said, well, they wouldn't turn up, they can't sell their books. They can't sell their DVDs. Absolutely true. So I won't spend too much time uh, castigating those that were not there. But I will just make that point, that it is a concern that back in June it was left to a handful of us to have a presence, and yesterday it fell to a handful of us to have a presence, and praise the Lord for that. Well, last night I started to look at the scripture to think about what to speak about this morning, and First Timothy chapter 6 came to mind. I thought, yes, very appropriate. And in First Timothy chapter 6... Paul tells us in verse 1, Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honour, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. You are either a servant to sin or a servant to the Saviour. And one of the arguments that was put to us yesterday, well many were put to us, but to just a couple I guess, were how that if Christ has died for all of us, we don't need to ask to be forgiven, that we've all been automatically forgiven. No, you have been atoned for, your sin has been covered, but you've got to receive it. And of course, if you don't receive it, you can't be forgiven. And it's like I've said before, if I put money into your account, it won't benefit you until you personally receive it. And all these young men trying to score points over us, ganging up on some of the sisters, and yet if we had one Islamic woman there, surrounded by five or six Christian men, you'd never hear the end of it. It would go online, the media would pick it up, and they would call us all sorts of names. And yet five or six, seven or eight, nine or ten Islamic men surrounding a Christian woman, they thought nothing of it whatsoever. Shame on them. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honour, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Some people say, well, I'm not a servant of sin. I'm not in bondage to anything. I put it to you this way. Until you're born again, you are a servant of sin. You are very much in bondage to sin. And without going down the Martin Luther route, who spoke about being completely incapable of doing anything until you're born again. I don't necessarily agree with that. But 
whoever you are, wherever you are, I think you are very much in bondage to someone or something. In fact, I'll say this, that crowd from yesterday, about 90% Islamic men, are in bondage to a system. They worship their system. And again, that picture of pride was uh, something which the devil experienced, and as a result, he fell. And some of these men are going to fall hard. Look at verse 2. And they that have believer masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren, but rather do them service, because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. I can honestly say, in all the jobs I've ever had, I've never once had a believing master. Never once have I had a boss who was saved. Never once have I worked with a saved work colleague. I've always been the only person in my environment that has been saved. And that is somewhat of a challenge. And that sharpens your uh, testimony. That very much sharpens who you are as a Christian. And yet, for the most, those that I am aware of, those that have teaching ministries... Those that are pastors or evangelists have never had jobs. They go from school to university to Bible seminary to the pulpit. And they preach about how to live it, how to do this, how to do that. And yet they've never had to do it themselves. And I go back to my earlier comment. Where were the great PhDs yesterday? Where were the great scholars? Where were the evangelists? We have a few in the UK, not many, but we have a few. And I can think of three people who I shan't name. Where were they yesterday? But here, Paul is making it clear that they that have believing masters, let them not despise them. You've got a picture here of a first century saved individual, probably a working class individual, whose boss is saved. I guess he'd be working class, the individual, and his boss would be middle class. And Paul says, don't despise him, they're brethren, but rather do them service, because they are faithful and beloved. Partakers of the benefit, these things teach and exhort. <clears throat> now the context, of course, from Timothy 1 and 2 is about service, how to be a faithful evangelist how to do the work of an evangelist which is street work of course public work and then teaching like-minded people the word of god and yet we'd be told in first timothy i think it's chapter three how the elders or the pastors or the deacons whatever it's to be called or whatever we want to call them should be known in the community they should be known by people outside of their four walls and yet for the most part you don't see these people they don't go outside their four walls. They're too busy preaching to the choir. Look at verse 3. If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, rallyings, evil surmisings, perverse dis disputings of men or corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth. Supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself, I'm going to call this message Corrupt Minds because we met many people yesterday. We met atheists, we met Muslims, probably one Catholic, one SDA individual. But most of those present yesterday were Islamic. Corrupt Minds, proud, verse 4, knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words. Your saviour is a racist. He called a woman a dog. Well, maybe she was a dog. Maybe she was a whore. I take the, the uh, view that Christ knew more about her than we knew about her. You mean to tell me your saviour is a racist? You okay to follow a racist? It's kind of rich coming from a Muslim who follows a man who married a six-year-old girl and took her virginity when she was nine. I mean, please. Wealth cometh envy, strife, rallyings, evil surmisings. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds. Such were corrupt. Such were trying to score points. Such were very much uh, using a plan of attack, a picture of strategy, or a picture of uh, how can we make Christians look stupid. Let's uh, surround those that turn up, and let's go for the kill. Now, Christians aren't like that. Christians don't go for the kill. We were told to love our enemies. We were told to pray for those which despitefully use us. We were told to be gentle. We were told to uh, turn the other cheek, so on and so forth. We don't go for the kill. And I've had many conversations over the last 14 years. I've never, to the best of my knowledge, ever gone to an environment and decided to go for the kill. Never once. Yes, I can be abrasive. I can be sharp. Maybe come across as self-righteous. That's not my goal. But never do I uh, start out to go for the kill. And I would never uh, surround a, a Muslim woman or a JW woman or a Mormon woman or any woman 
and pretty much lay into her. And I saw that several times yesterday concerning our two sisters. And don't get me wrong, they weren't able to not defend themselves. They stood their ground and praised the Lord for them. They both did a great job. But my point is, we wouldn't do that to their people. We wouldn't take their women on like that, secular or religious. Suppose that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. So the question will be asked to me, no doubt, when this message goes online. Was it worth going, James? What did you achieve? You should have done this. You should have done that. Listen, you weren't there. If you're not there, keep your mouth shut. We were there. We were very much in the lion's den. We were a minority of minorities, like most Bible believers in the UK are. So until you've been into that environment, keep your mouth shut. I know it sounds somewhat uh, uh, hard to say that. And maybe some people are saying, you know, James is somewhat upset. No, but I'm making the point that all uh, such talk is all very well, but if you're just an armchair critic, your view is completely irrelevant to me. Verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Absolutely. And it'll say this, for those of us which are saved, we have to open our mouths. We have to go into environments. We have to get out of our comfort zones. Not all the time, but some of the time. I'll tell you something, until you do that, you've never lived. You have never lived. What we did yesterday was a great blessing to do. We had the devil on our backs pretty much from day one of arriving here. In fact, even before we came here, lots of dramas, lots of trials and tribulations. Yesterday was a somewhat fraught day, but praise the Lord, we persevered. And I think we did a great job without blowing our own trumpets. Look at verse 7, please. If we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out... And I made the case yesterday to a group of atheists that 100 years from now, all of us are going to be dead. All this talk about injustice, all this talk about uh, problems around the world, trying to be a good person, trying to lower taxes, trying to fix the world, so on and so forth, will be of no interest to anybody. Most people live for themselves, die for themselves, and go to hell forever. And I asked a question today, and I put it on tape, what hope did we hear yesterday from those around us? I didn't hear anybody preach about how to get victory over sin, how to draw closer to the Lord, how to understand this book that we hold up to be the word of God, because it is the word of God. I heard, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. If you don't do this, or if you don't do that, or your guy said this, or your guy said that, trying to score points, trying to meet on an intellectual basis, which sometimes you can do. I know Paul would quote, uh, pagan writers from his generation, as would King David. And I made the case in the bus as we came home yesterday that I think it's beneficial for those of us which are Western to have some understanding of what the opposition holds to. Not too much, but just enough to be able to meet our opponents, partly on their own ground. But my view from yesterday was this, that I wasn't going there to bash the Muslims. I wasn't going there to examine Muhammad or the Quran, or, or the Hadith. I was going there to give tracts out, which we did, to give DVDs out, which we did, to get a banner up, which we did, and to take a stand for the word of God, to contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. That was my purpose, and I think that was all of our purpose from yesterday. We could have gone in there in an attack mode, like the uh, German U-boats did, when it came to sinking... Uh, the Merchant Navy and the Royal Navy, so on and so forth. But that's not what the Christian does. The last thing Christ on the cross was to forgive them for they don't know what they do. And yet when Muhammad died, he said, uh, kill all the Jews and the Christians. Two very different people when you look at Muhammad and Christ, Allah and Jehovah. And yet such were somewhat, I won't say skillful, but somewhat um, able to pick and choose which verses they wanted to go to, to make us look like we were fools. But it says here that he didn't know the time nor the place. And I said, yeah, but it also says that the Father and I are one. But it says here that my Father is greater than I. But it says there, you call me Lord and Master, and so I am. You can't win with these people. They pick and choose what they want. And yet, of course, like I keep saying, they are skilled, they are trained, they probably practice in their mosques once a week, twice a week as to how they're going to operate every Sunday afternoon. Well, good for them. I hope they're very proud of themselves when the final whistle is blown. But I'll make this point and bring this message to a conclusion. Five perverse 
disputings of men of corrupt minds, very much from yesterday, and destitute of the truth. That is incredible. Supposing that gain is godliness from such, withdraw thyself. So this is what I will say. Number one, can we debate with unsaved people? Yes, but it's got to be limited. And afterwards, withdraw from such people. Don't keep going over the same old ground with the same old people. Because if you do, you're going to cast your pearls before swine. And yes, it can be a fine line. I appreciate that. But we all agreed that after the service yesterday, we would go to Speaker's Corner and we would do what we could. And like I say, for three hours, the light shone from heaven on a very dark place. And nobody else, as far as I could see, were doing what we were doing yesterday for three hours. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Absolutely. But verse 4, he is proud, very much on display yesterday, knowing nothing. Men are corrupt minds, but doting about questions and strifes of words, like the Jews would do with the genealogy issue, or do you eat meat, or uh, do you do this, do you do that, do you drink alcohol? One lady went up to one of the sisters and said, uh, do you keep the Sabbath? Very much obsessed with the Sabbath, and I asked her, did the lady go to the Muslims? I said, hey guys, do you all keep the Sabbath? No, of course she didn't. She was too busy bending the sister's ear about the Sabbath, which according to Nehemiah chapter 9, was given to the children of Israel, not the church. And one of the Muslims from yesterday made a big song and dance about the Lord's Prayer, which doesn't mention the blood atonement. Well, why would it? And technically that was for Israel, not for the church. On top of that, it will have application to the millennium. But you see, they won't let you answer the question. They fire questions at you, all pre-planned, like I say, they're very good at what they do, like politicians, and as you start to respond to the question, if you can, they've got the next questions lined up. You can't end the question, you can't respond to the question, and when you try to respond to the question, they shut you down. So several times I said to one guy, well, different groups of people I should say, that I will terminate this conversation. You know, if I can't answer your question, if we can't have a dialogue, let's terminate it. And one guy, as I turned deliberately, carried on talking at me. Like a robot. He's proud. He doesn't know anything. Perverse. Disputings of men of corrupt minds. The mind is gone. I mean, it's one thing when your heart is desperately wicked, but when your mind is lost as well, you are in a bad way. Destitutes of the truth. They want to follow Muhammad? Okay, fine. Follow Muhammad. You want to follow the Pope? Follow, uh, follow the Pope. You want to follow Ellen White? Follow Ellen White. Supposing that gain is godliness. We crushed that uh, Christian woman. We got that Christian guy in a corner. We demolished him on this. We demolished her on that. No, you didn't. But even if you did, even if you did, you're, you are supposing that gain is godliness. You think you've won a victory? Big deal. But you didn't, incidentally. But if you thought you did, well, so what? From such, withdraw thyself. This is a holy book. We serve a holy God. And once a person gets saved, they are holy. So in essence, what you saw yesterday were the sheep, all six of us, Debating probably, directly and indirectly, maybe, let's think now, uh, 300 goats, can I say that? 400 goats? Yeah. You've got around six uh, wheat, taking on 300 tares. You've got a tiny church, a tiny Christian presence, taking on 300 Mohammedans. Maybe three or four Catholics, one SDA, some atheists. But the point is this, we were a minority of minorities and it felt good it felt really good seven for we brought nothing into this world including your salvation something this crowd have got no idea about they think by keeping the five pillars of islam or going to mass or keeping the sabbath that somehow god is going to be pleased with them that somehow you will congratulate them i've got news for you it's going to condemn you that will not save you and it is certain we can carry nothing out including your good works and this is where Christianity stands head and shoulders above every other faith system in the world. But I will say this, that what I saw yesterday is not only typical of society in general, it's typical to some extent as to what I was like before I was saved. I was somewhat sure of myself. People used to say that I had uh, an old head and young shoulders. Big deal. Before I was saved, I didn't know anything. I was lost. I was dead, literally. Well, not literally, but you know what I mean, dead spiritually from the neck up. And I would get into debates with people about different subjects. And sometimes I thought I'd won the debate, but it doesn't make any difference. In fact, many times Christ 
wouldn't even get into such discussions. He would answer a question with a question, which is what I, what I did yesterday. But there are no real rules, I think, when it comes to such a place as Speaker's Corner. You get in and you get out. You don't retreat like a coward. You go and you're good and ready to go. You stand your ground and you try and reflect the Saviour's glory, the Saviour's reputation. So this has been day four, or this is the beginning of day four. And these verses, I think, are very applicable to what we saw yesterday. And yes, Paul would debate the Judaizers of his day. And yet, if I know Paul, he would move on to different groups. He wouldn't keep going back to the same old crowd as would the Lord. He went from town to town, village to village, preaching the gospel, which is what we're doing. We are here for several days and we have been able to work three or four spots in central London throughout a typical day. We don't stand at the same spot all day long, every day. And we've been blessed to speak to different people. Yesterday was a unique day, of course, very much like going to the Vatican, I would imagine, a somewhat unique experience, something which you don't do every day of the week. But it was good, and these verses, I think, make it very clear that you're dealing with unsaved people, children of the devil, in bondage to sin, trusting in a false system. They have no hope. They have no real gospel. They are working as a pack, like I say, and the whole purpose uh, is to bring Christianity down and unfortunately most Christians have capitulated most Christians have thrown in the towel most professing Christians wouldn't do what we did yesterday but uh, as I say it was good to go and do it we have no regrets and we move on from yesterday and we get into today and the next several days so Timothy 1 6 1 2 7 very applicable verses to read for today and we give the Lord thanks for yesterday and I think I will leave it there and close one final time in verse 7 and conclude. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. But in between arriving and departing, as saved people, we want to preach the gospel. We want to glorify the Saviour. We want to speak to people. We want to get the word of God out. We want to take a stand, not aggressively, but tactfully, uh, sensibly, um, gently, and above all, in the power of the Holy Ghost. I can't imagine arriving at such a place as Speaker's Corn in the flesh and trying to do what we did yesterday in the flesh. I think the Lord would cut you down before they even got anywhere near you. It'd be absolutely a disaster to be suicidal to even attempt to go into such a place in the flesh. But uh, it's all good. And as Paul said, uh, whatever we do, 1 Corinthians 15, is not only for the glory of God, but on top of that, it isn't in vain. And I'll say this, anybody who watches the material which goes online and thinks that somehow it was a waste, you're wrong. It wasn't a waste. It was glorifying to the Lord. People heard the gospel, and people were listening as well. I will say that not all were talking, some were listening. So I don't think that somehow it was all in vain, not at all. It was a great blessing to be able to go to a tiny part of London, a very dark part of London, and take on many Muslims. Also, I'll say this, that had anybody been present yesterday that wanted to know the truth, they would have come forward. I said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Yeah. Nobody came forward to ask that question. Yes, we met some saved people, and they took tracks, and they were encouraged by our presence, but nobody came forward to ask what they needed to do to be saved. So, we leave with our heads held high. We thank the Lord for allowing us to go there, for representing him. And maybe some of those young Islamists who have been raised in that system, who don't know anything else, will examine themselves or think how well we conducted ourselves. We weren't rude, we weren't abrasive, we weren't hostile, we weren't uh, seeking to shout anybody down. We took questions, we responded to their questions, but when it came to the latter part of verse 5, from such withdraw thyself, we said to ourselves, okay, it's time to go now. We're going over the same old ground with the same old people. We are now casting our pearls before swine. Our time is precious. 
we want to be where we are really needed the most and after three hours we thought it was time to move on plus one of our brothers had to go back to his home to get a train awaiting him so keep all that in mind please when you watch the material and like I say you weren't there so don't say I would have done this or I would have done that or you should have done this or you should have done that you weren't there so with all due respects you weren't there don't offer us advice and until you go to such a place, until you uh, experience such a place, uh, can I say respectfully to keep your views to yourselves. But uh, keep us in prayer. We've got some more days to be here and pray for those that saw the banner yesterday and took the tracks. It can take several years for certain people to get saved. And uh, as Paul would say, rejoice the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Okay, so this is day number five. And this is Bible study number four. And I wanted to start today's Bible study with some readings from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Just to, I guess, go back to Sunday's uh, trip to Speaker's Corner. To try and understand what we were up against. Sometimes it takes a little while to fully understand what took place. But Paul told us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So he was told very clearly that his remit wasn't to baptize, per se, and yet he would baptize people, but to preach the gospel, which is what we did on Sunday, and have been doing since Sunday, and will continue to do until this outreach concludes this coming Friday. Not with wisdom of words, and yet for many of those present on Sunday, they were using a lot of wisdom, trying to go back and forth, using secular history to attack us, and so-called knowledge of the Quran, a book uh, which wasn't even written by Muhammad, if the man even lived, but by others, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Before you are saved, you are very much dead in your sins. In fact, this book isn't even for you until you are born again. You can't understand the word of God until you're born again. You can't understand God or his ways until you're born again and that's why it's imperative to get the balance right yes we want to speak to people we want to take questions use apologetics to some extent and uh, many of our islamic friends quote unquote were using islamic apologists or apologetics against us this past sunday but ultimately people are going to be saved by the word of god otherwise the cross of christ is of none effect in fact, somebody once said, if you could speak somebody, or if you could talk to somebody into the kingdom of God, someone could come along and talk them out of it. And there's much truth in that as well. We simply preach the gospel, we do what we can, and the Holy Ghost does the rest. Look at verse 18, please. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. And my initial... Uh, Conversation began with a group of atheists who thought what I was saying was foolish and I was referred to as being a nut, uh, as being somewhat insane, that if I was to off myself as Abraham did, and Abraham was a friend of the Lord, he had the Lord speak to him that somehow I'd be sectioned, detained. And I said, well, I'm happy to be called a nut for Christ. Paul would tell you that we are fools for Christ's sake. And yet for many Christians, they would absolutely hate the idea of being put into an environment such as Speaker's Corner, to be put on the spot, to be made to feel very uncomfortable. It is fair to say that it's not a natural environment for many of us to be in. You're very much out of your comfort zones. And yet, nevertheless, it's good. It's good to be there. But the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. I'm also very much aware that for many of those people from last Sunday, they are never going to be saved anyway. And therefore, you have to box clever. On the one hand, we want to defend what we believe, contemn of the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints, and yet we want to speak to people that are present, they may be listening. On top of that, we don't know what people are thinking inside. When you've got a group of people, especially men, like alpha male, all standing together, trying to uh, show off, trying to give the impression of being uh, very knowledgeable, they can't afford to lose face in the presence of their peers. And that's why the atmosphere was somewhat electrified. And yet here's the thought to consider. When those people go home, they are on their own. They're not in their pack anymore. They're not on the prowl anymore. 
And it may just be that for some of those people, what they heard at the end of that day or the following day or a couple of weeks and months may actually start to cause them to examine themselves. And I think we did plant seeds and yet I'm not overly disappointed or I'm not overly surprised to see such working in a pack, like I said, very much doing apologetics from an Islamic standpoint to give the impression of being united. And yet when they go home, the seed is planted and their conscience starts to take a hold. At least that's what I think anyway. Look at 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. We saw so many people this past Sunday who gave the impression of being something special. Great experts when it comes to the Bible. Great experts when it comes to secular historians. And yet, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. This is God speaking. And will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. He's going to cut these people down. 20. Where is the wise? Where is a scribe? Where is a disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Absolutely. And that's why we do witness to people. We do speak to people. We do take questions from people. But what we don't want to do is spend too much time with the same people. Going over the same old ground. Don't cast your pearls before swine. Get in and get out. There's plenty more fish in the sea. 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. In a way that I don't quite understand, just our presence glorifies the Lord. The preaching of the gospel on a cold street corner, or hot street corner, glorifies the Lord. And as a result, those that believe it get saved. On top of street preaching, just open your mouth. Preach the gospel, share the gospel, share your testimony. That's what saves people, the word of God. Of course, if you can meet these people on their own ground, go for it. But don't get too tangled up in their way of life. They walk in darkness. They are spiritually dead. They cannot comprehend almighty God. Like I say before, you are born again. This book is closed to you. You don't know God. He doesn't know you. You don't know his ways. You are completely dead. It's like sitting down with a child and trying to explain the Japanese stock market. You wouldn't even attempt to. 22. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God, and the wisdom of God. What we saw on Sunday, in many ways was the Muslims replacing the Judaizers. What you got, in essence, was this. You've got, you had 21st century Muslims replacing 1st century Jews attacking people like Paul, people like the Lord Jesus Christ. And you've got the Islamists being the modern-day Judaizers, claiming to be experts in what they uh, were telling us, able to quote the scripture, uh, so too can the devil. So what? Anybody can quote the scripture, but do you believe it? So the, the, the roles are reversed in a very uh, unexpected way. The Jews, 22, require a sign. And yet they had signs left, right and centre. And for the most part, it made no difference whatsoever. And the Greeks, the Gentiles, the scholars, the academics, seek after wisdom. And for many of our friends this past Sunday, what we were preaching to them went right over their heads, which isn't to be of any surprise to us and yet it is somewhat grievous to see such people totally incapable of receiving the truth of Christ and wanting to follow Muhammad a warlord a very promiscuous man a very dangerous man a very violent man and yet as we say you get the governments that you deserve you want Muhammad you're welcome to him but we 23 preach Christ crucified rejoice in that amen Unto the Jews and Muslims, a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks, academics, atheists, foolishness. But unto them which are called, that's all of us this morning, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. So I'm aware that for most of those people present on Sunday, they're not God's people. Nobody came over to me and said, how can I get saved? Nobody said, will you please, uh, will you please uh, pray for me? So it would appear... This past Sunday, the Lord's people weren't present. But again, we don't know what happens down the line. You've got a group of Islamic males standing together, going to the same mosque, probably role-playing, meeting day in, day out, probably working together. 
They won't want to lose face in the presence of their peers. But when they go home and on their own, then their conscience just starts to kick in. 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. If you were to go to such a place in your own power, in your own might, your own intellect, I put it to you this morning that Almighty God would cut you down. You've got to go into such an environment through the power, with your power, of the anointing of the Holy Ghost, otherwise it's all in vain. And I said to some atheists that I'm only here today to preach the gospel, to share the word of God with you. It doesn't matter who I am or what I am, what I believe or what I don't believe, who cares? 100 years from now, everyone's going to be dead. And according to my Bible, it's either heaven or hell. There'll be no discussions about Muhammad or this or that in hell. They'll be weeping and wailing and gnashing their teeth. 26. For you see your calling, brethren, how there are not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things which are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. And that's the truth of the matter. For the most part, those that get called are just ordinary, everyday people, like the apostles. For the most part, ordinary upper working class, lower middle class, self-employed fishermen. Not scholars, not academics. Paul would be the exception. Dr. Luke would be the exception. But for the most part, just ordinary people called to do a very unique uh, work, a very unusual work. And of course, you know, they are the apostles. But 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. And that's something which none of our Friends, quote-unquote, could get clear in their minds this past Sunday. They actually think that their good works are going to somehow help them, that their God is going to be somewhat pleased with them when they arrive in eternity. Nothing could be further from the truth. Please turn to Second Timothy. Second Timothy chapter 2, Scripture with Scripture. And we looked at First Timothy yesterday, and I was reading Second Timothy last night, and Titus. And it's amazing how these epistles discuss the types of people that we were speaking to on Sunday. Again, the Muslims replaced the Jews, and we, the church, I guess, replaced the tiny remnants of believers, Jew and Gentile, in the first century. Second Timothy, chapter 2, look at verse 23, please. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strifes. Absolutely true. And yet again, when you are taking questions from people, when you are trying to engage people, you like to think that for the most, they are sincere, trying to get answers. Just yesterday, Patrick spoke to a woman for maybe 10 minutes outside Euston train station. Many deep questions, probably too deep to discuss on a street corner. And he was of the opinion that she was sincerely seeking. Maybe she was, maybe she wasn't, we don't know. Fast forward several hours, he spoke to a Jesuit priest. Very different sort of person who wasn't asking any kind of questions, who was somewhat coy, who was somewhat defensive, who was somewhat diplomatic. And he got two very different people there. A lady from the morning outreach, searching to some extent, trying to know what is what compared to the other person who would claim to have all the answers. He's had 14 years theological training. He's probably a linguist. He's probably into all sorts of uh, things which would put him in the class of academia. And yet even with such a person, seeds can be planted. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid. And that's what I did on Sunday. There were many groups that were gathering around me and others, asking the same questions, but in different ways. I thought to myself, I've already dealt with this question from this group of people. I'm not going to go over the same ground with this group of people. And in the end, we decided after three hours to call it a day. Knowing that they do gender strifes. On top of that, the more you engage people who aren't saved, who have heard the gospel, the more accountable they're going to be at the judgment. And that's one of the reasons why you were told to separate from unsaved people. Not only because they can contaminate you, 
but also for their own sakes. The more light you give someone who isn't listening, who doesn't want to hear the truth, the more they're going to be damned. And that's why Christ would speak in parables many of the times, so that those that were in his presence, like the unbelieving Judaizers, very much like our friends on Sunday, the Islamists, could hear what he was saying and yet not understand it. This goes back to what I've been saying all along, that this book isn't for the world, really. This message is for those that humble themselves, those that receive it. 24. And the servants of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Now, in the context, this is speaking about saved people who got caught up in sin, like Ananias and Sapphira, won't repent, and as a result, die prematurely, the sin unto death. But we can take this verse, and we will, and apply it to our friends from Sunday, apply it to people in general who like to argue, who like to debate, who like to score points over those who have opposing views they are very much taken by the devil ensnared by the devil children of the devil can't get out and as a result are going to be damned it's a terrifying thought that for far too many people religious people trying to do religion trying to be good muslims and yet when they die they will go straight to hell and they'll see us at the great white throne judgment we will be standing with the Lord as spectators, and they'll start pointing at us, perhaps, and saying, we remember you. You shared, you know, you shared the gospel with us, the speaker's corner. You told us about the Lord Jesus Christ, and we didn't want to hear it. We knew better than you did. And he says, down in his boys, confess my son is your Lord. And they do. Philippians chapter 2, and off they go into a lake of fire. And they burn, and they burn, and they burn. You see, we will tell people that. We will tell people that... If you don't repent, you will perish. And yet this Jesuit from last night, I'd be amazed if he's ever given a tract out a day in his life, if he's ever gone to Speaker's Corner and called on Islamists to repent, I'd be amazed if he's ever led a soul to the Lord in his whole life. He's very much a defender of his faith, not a preacher of the gospel. Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. Look at verse 10, please. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Again, it's so reminiscent of Sunday. Many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. I count at least two converts to Islam from Sunday. Two Irishmen, probably raised Catholic, although I may be wrong, that have converted to Islam. A very strange thing to behold. Most people that are Muslim are born Muslim. Most Westerners, most Caucasians don't convert to Islam. In fact, one of my conversations, which wasn't recorded, went along the lines of this, that most people in the Middle East are leaving Islam and converting to Christianity, which is a fact. But most people in this country, most Muslims in this country were born Muslim. It's all they've ever known. You don't get many people, Westerners, converting to Islam. But these two Irishmen were the exception. In fact, one was drunk. For many are unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. Now again, the context is aimed, this is aimed at the Judaizers in the context. And yet the Muslims are very much, in my mind, as I read this this morning. And they also boast in their circumcision. They boast in their abstinence from foods. They boast in what they do and don't do. I don't drink alcohol. I don't smoke. I don't do this. I don't do that. Yes, but you beat your wife up, don't you? You've got four wives, haven't you? See, externally, they may appear to be very righteous, but how about internally? One of the reasons why so many Islamic women wear burqas is because they're beaten up. They're bruised. In fact, they were told in the Quran to beat your wives, whose mouths must be stopped, spiritually, not physically, of course, who subvert whole houses. Again, the context would be the Judaizers going around in the first century trying to undermine Paul, Peter, James and John. And yet, let's keep spiritualizing this to our Islamic friends, because this is so relevant. Teaching things which they ought not. Jesus can't save you. He didn't die on the cross. It was Judas. A ridiculous claim to make. In fact, I said to 
one Islamic chap, I said, give me three of your best points, three of the best proofs that Muhammad ever lived. Go for it. He couldn't give me three good proofs. I said, give me two. He couldn't give me two good proofs. So I gave him three. I said to him, outside this book, we've got the Talmud, we've got Josephus, we've got Fiddy the Younger. That's just three individual sources, about 35 in total. You guys couldn't even give me three. You couldn't give me two. But they do it, according to uh, verse 11, for filthy Lucas' sake. I'm not sure if our Islamic friends were there on Sunday for financial gain. Probably not, I wouldn't like to say. I think it's mainly sport, like you find back in the Old Testament concerning Samson. Let him make sport for us. And those Philistines, which today are the Palestinians, enemies of Israel, put Samson on show to make sport, like I say. Go to uh, Mark chapter 7. One of the preposterous questions put to us this past Sunday was whether or not Jesus was a racist. And this was a very bizarre question to be asked. I mean, to think that Christ left heaven, came to earth, lived a perfect life, was pretty much mocked from day one, died for the sins of the world, and after three days was raised from the dead. To think that he could be a racist is somewhat of a joke. In fact, it's quite insulting. But we kept calm. We didn't lose our temper. We allowed these people to have their say, because one day their words will be used against them. Whatever you do in darkness, we're brought to light. By your words, you are justified, and by your words, you are condemned. And the question surrounds this piece of scripture from Mark chapter 7, which is also mirrored in, I think it's Matthew 15, and Luke also picks us up. Matthew 7, let's read this verse and see what scripture says. Matthew 7, look at verse 25, please. For a certain woman, whose young daughter had an unclean spirit, heard of him, and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a South Phoenician by nation, and she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. You've got a woman whose daughter has an unclean spirit. She hears of Jesus, she finds him and falls at his feet, something Muhammad never did. 26, this woman was a Greek, a Gentile, a South Phoenician by nation. She's a Canaanite. Now the Canaanites were enemies of Israel. The Canaanites were a wicked bunch of people. They did terrible things to their own people, hence why Joshua was told to go in and kill them all. On top of that, they wanted to seduce Israel. And that's exactly what happened. Israel was seduced in their thousands. And as a result, God punished them as well. So that's the context. You've got a woman, a Gentile, a South Phoenician, who's probably immoral. She's got a daughter who has got an unclean spirit. She's come seeking Christ to deliver her daughter from this unclean spirit. The Jews couldn't do it. Muhammad couldn't do it. But Christ could and would. She falls at his feet from 25. And he goes on to say, And she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. Now she had faith that this could happen. She'd probably seen others being set free from unclean spirits. So she's got a leap of faith. And that faith has paid off. 27. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled. For it is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it unto the dogs. And that word dogs was mentioned time after time on Sunday. You mean to tell me that Jesus would call somebody a dog? Yes, he would. But what's the context? The context is 25. Woman, daughter, unclean spirit. She's humbled herself. 26, she's a Greek, Gentile, South Phoenician, a Canaanite. She's probably a whore. She's probably an immoral woman. Could be a prostitute. And if she humbles herself, and she asks him to deal with the issue at hand, and he says, 27 again, let the children the Jews, first be filled. In other words, I've come first of all to the children of Israel. For it is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it unto the dogs, meaning the Gentiles. And this piece of scripture went over the heads of most of those present on Sunday. Let's keep reading on, 28. And she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. A great picture of humbling herself. And he said unto her, For this saying, Go thy way, the devil has gone out, of thy daughter. And when she was come to her house, she found the devil gone out and her daughter laid upon the bed. I'll say this. This woman was a Gentile, not a Jew. She wasn't part of the Old Testament covenant. She was outside of the Old Testament covenant. She wasn't even in the New Testament covenant. She was an enemy of God, according to uh, what Paul tells us, that we are enemies of the Lord. 
very much outside of the remit of the Lord. And yet she humbled herself, she fell at his feet, and she begged him to deal with her daughter who was indwelt by an unclean spirit. And he said to her, last part of verse 27, how it's not right to give crumbs to the dogs. And she says, yes, Lord, but even the dogs that under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And I made the point that maybe she was a dog. Maybe she was a whore. Maybe she was an immoral woman. Let's not shy away from these things. Christ would call the Pharisees snakes and vipers. He would call Herod a fox. And I think it's quite fair to say that he knew far more about this woman's heart than we do sitting around this table this morning or that bunch of imbeciles from Speaker's Corner this past Sunday. Another question put to me was whether or not Jesus was a refugee because he was told to leave Israel and go into Egypt for a period of time. I thought, what a bizarre question to ask me. Even his parents would have to live by faith. God didn't do everything for them all of the time. They had to live by faith. They were told to get out of Israel and go into Egypt until Herod and Co. had died. Go to Revelation 22 and I will close. Revelation 22. Iron sharpens iron. It is good to witness to people. It is good to try and take such questions on and answer them. Uh, and yet, again, it's always good to draw a line in the sand and retreat when you're good and ready. Revelation 22, look at verse 15. For without are dogs and sorcerers, and whoremongers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. That term for dog can also mean sinners in general, not just sexual sin, but sin in general. In fact, if you were to say to somebody, you're a dirty dog, even now it has a pretty negative connotation. But in the context, I would say it's a Jew speaking about a Gentile. Because historically, Jews looked upon Gentiles as dogs, unclean animals. As do Muslims, I might add as well. In fact, Muslims hate dogs as pets because they see them as unclean animals. But historically, dogs were seen as unclean by Jews. In fact, even now, the Jews think that Gentiles are still unclean and that reference back in Genesis chapter 3 about the two seeds, the serpent seed and the uh, seed of Eve. They think that the serpent seed is in reference to the Gentiles, interestingly enough. Mm -hmm. But that's the historical context. The 25, for without, outside of the millennial kingdom, we're now into eternity, are dogs. Unclean, unsaved Gentiles, unclean, unsaved Jews. And sorcerers, pretty clear term, clairvoyances, so on and so forth. And whoremongers, male and female, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth, and maketh a lie. So the scripture doesn't shy away from this, that if you're not saved, you're unsaved. And on top of that, you are probably referred to and considered to be a dog in the eyes of the Lord. And we shouldn't shy away from that. If he called her a dog, she was a dog. Did he love her? Yes. Did he help her? Yes. Did he answer her prayer? Yes. Even though... She wasn't technically part of his dispensation. And what I tried to say on Sunday, I wasn't able to because it kept shouting over me, was how in John chapter 10 he told us how he had sheep that were not yet of his fold. Other sheep not yet of his covenant, in reference to the Gentiles, of course. When it tells us in uh, John chapter 4 how he was a saviour of the world, it means just that. How he was and is a saviour of the world. And that includes Jews, Gentiles, Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, Freemasons, Jesuits, Everyone that will humble themselves and be saved. He loves everybody, but that is conditional on you receiving him. Outside of him, outside the cross, there's no hope, no salvation. Okay, so we are still in London. This is day number six, and this is Bible study number five. And we continue to review the past few days, and the outreach continues in earnest. And it's been a great outreach, and it continues to be a great outreach. People are seeing the banner, people are still taking tracks, and I guess it's fair to say thousands have seen the banner. And from our standpoint, sometimes we try and measure these uh, outreaches a particular way, which can be problematic, so it's best not to. It's best just to enjoy what you're doing and allow the Lord to do the rest. This type of ministry, when it comes to street work or outreach in general, can be a long-term uh, ministry. You don't get a lot of results overnight, and that's why it's good to pace yourself. It's good not to expect too much too soon, otherwise you can get discouraged. 
and disappointed. We know from 1 Corinthians 15, 52, I think it's memory, that everything we do is for the Lord's glory and is not in vain. Sometimes just standing on a street corner holding a banner up glorifies the Lord in ways that we can't possibly comprehend. Yes, it would be nice if people were lining up, asking questions, like, sirs, what must I do to be saved? But that's pretty rare. Mm-hmm. We live in a post-Christian generation now. We are very much a minority of minorities. And I think as we get near to the rapture, this is going to continue to be the trend. So it's imperative that we stay in the love of God, that we stay close to God, and that we read the word of God each and every day without fail. It's like everything. The more you put in, the more you get out. But from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the scripture says very clearly in verse 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And that is the truth of the matter. If you are like I am, very much wanting to get people saved, and persevering with people, and trying to connect with people about things of the Lord, it can be very difficult because you're dealing with a sin, you're dealing with indifference, but you're also dealing with the fact that such are unsaved. And before we were saved, we were called enemies of the cross. Pretty uh, negative thing to say, but it's true. And looking back to this past Sunday, pretty much all those present at Speaker's Corner were unsaved, but they can't comprehend, they can't receive the things of the Lord, they are spiritually discerned. In fact, such is foolishness to them. But the natural man, the natural woman, meaning before they are regenerated, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto them, neither can they know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And our Calvinist friends come along, and if they ever do share the gospel with people, which is kind of rare, they will pretty much say to the sort of crowd that we met on Sunday, well, if you can't receive this, you're not one of the elect. I can't help you, somewhat pompous attitude, and slam the door in that particular person's face. Now, I kind of understand that. I don't agree with that, but I understand that. And we've all got our old natures, and we can all get short-tempered and slam the door in people's faces. But the truth of the matter is this, that... Until you are regenerated, until you are saved, this word, known as the Holy Bible, is closed to you. Almighty God is unknown to you. And what we are doing is foolishness to you. And that's why I made the case yesterday and the day before that it's so important that we don't spend too much time with people going over the same old ground. And again, allow ourselves to preach to the wider crowd. There were groups within groups that were at Speaker's Corner, mostly mocking, mostly looking to pull us down. But I was preaching to the people behind them, to the wider community. And we had many conversations with professing Christians and some that were not professing Christians. But one last time, Second Corinthians 2.14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. So whatever you say to them, they can't stand it anyway. If they won't humble themselves, if Almighty God doesn't reveal his will to them, his way to them, his word to them. They've got no way whatsoever of comprehending what you are saying to them. You may as well be preaching to a brick wall because they are spiritually dead. For they are foolishness unto him concerning the things of God. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. It's very much like a need-to-know basis. And they need to know this, but they won't get it until they are born again. Go to Matthew 23. The Lord Jesus Christ uh, spent three and a half years on this earth, crisscrossing Israel and Syria and parts of Jordan, preaching the gospel. I think it's fair to say the reason why he spent three and a half years on the earth wasn't necessarily to preach to other saved people, but it was to preach to the saved people, to build up the apostles, to set the pace for them, to set the example to them and for them, to see what would be expected of them. And yet time after time, he came up against self-righteous religious people, like the Muslims from Speaker's Corner. And incidentally, where were the communists? Where were the fascists? Where were the politicians? Most of the crowd from Sunday are and were and continue to be from the religious realm. Interesting. 
But in Matthew 23, verse 13, we read, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer them that are entering to go in. That's damning. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, religious people, not ordinary everyday people like the woman at the well or Mary and Martha, but religious people, people that should have known better. For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. They put the brakes on, literally. And I spent many a year witnessing to people on the streets and making progress, thinking to myself, this is going quite well, a good conversation. And then someone comes along and butts in. This happened the year before last in Hastings, from memory. We were speaking to a group of Mormons, about half a dozen. And it was going quite well. And this guy came over on uh, crutches, somewhat drunk, and started to interfere. And I thought to myself, you've got no interest whatsoever in what we are doing here, what we are trying to achieve. You've watched us for over an hour. And yet the moment we start to speak to people about the Lord, he comes over, puts his nose in our affairs, and starts to take people away from what we were trying to do, trying to change the subject, trying to interfere. Just typical. But here these Pharisees and hypocrites, very much uh, reminiscent, very typical, very much a reflection of the crowd we met on Sunday, are shutting up the kingdom of heaven. Let me say this to you. If I wasn't a Christian, I wouldn't bother with any other religious system in the world. I've been saved 14 years. I was in my 20s when I got saved. So I know pretty much how this world works. I wouldn't want to waste five minutes trying to join another religious system. If I can't get this down, if I can't understand this Bible, if Christ doesn't work for me, or if I don't work for him, or if this doesn't materialize, I wouldn't waste five minutes going anywhere else. I'd just walk away and become Joe Secular. That's the absolute truth. It's hard enough being a Christian. I think it was Joe Foreman who said, to be a Christian takes a real man. To pray in public, to be a good example to your family, to give out tracts, to abstain from this, to abstain from that, is tough. It's really hard. And yet these Muslims come along, telling us that our saviour was a racist, that he's not God, that he was a refugee, is not only insulting, it's not only blasphemous, it's absurd, because when you put him to Muhammad, the two don't even match up. So I'll say this, if I wasn't a Christian, and I came into contact with a Muslim, I wouldn't give him five minutes, because his guy, or their guy Muhammad, was no good. Their system is works, works, works. And I was raised in a system with works, works, works. I'll tell you something, it did nothing for me. And here these Pharisees are being condemned. Why? Well, A, they are preaching on the gospel, and B, they are trying to get people away from the true gospel, the true God, to follow themselves. 14. Why aren't you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites? For you devour widows' houses, and for pretense make long prayer. Therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. Very typical of the Catholics as well. The Hail Mary, the Our Father, Long prayers, very repetitious, also condemned back in Matthew chapter 6. And it's tragedy. It's absolutely tragic because what we experience on Sunday, and I've experienced this over many years, is that people will receive anyone and anything but Jesus Christ. He's not enough for them. His gospel is too simplistic for them. They want to do religion. They want to be part of a system. They want to be part of a group. But here it says how they shall receive the greater damnation. I guess it's fair to say there will be a part in hell reserved for religious people. The popes, the rabbis, the mullahs. Not just secularists, not just wicked people. And it's bad enough that such are going to hell. But it's even worse that they are going to take people with them in their droves. 15. Well unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. If you come to see a land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. That's the truth of the matter. You want to go to hell? Okay, fine. You go to hell. You want to do religion? Okay, fine. You do religion. But don't take people with you. It's like the Catholic Church. They put a council together back in the 16th century. And I'm speaking about the Council of Trent. To attack Protestants, ex-Catholics. To undermine the Reformation. To ridicule those of us which hold to the book. And these good godly men, I don't think, decided that if that wasn't enough, they were going to put 125 curses on ex-Catholics like ourselves who were born again. And those curses remain, were never done away with. They're still very much up and running today. And as such, when a Catholic gets saved, he slash she is condemned by their own church. And that's why we tell them to get out of that system. On top of that, 
they were told from Revelation 18 to get out. But you see, it comes down to this. It's power. We need to control the people. You read about that in John 11. If this man continues to preach to people, if people continue to follow this man, we will lose our kingdom, we will lose our place with the Romans, we will become redundant. And I think it's fair to say that if everybody were born again, if everyone got saved, mosques would close overnight, churches would close overnight, and so-called places of worship would close overnight. Of course, you know it's not going to happen, because people want to do something. I've got to do something. I can't just believe in Christ alone. I've got to do something. And when you start to do that, when you start to add to the atonement, you fall from grace, you cheapen grace, and as a result, you very much offend our great God. So Matthew 23, 13, one more time. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. They are hypocrites. They preach, on the one hand, that they are holy, and in reality, they are not. They shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, putting works into the equation. They don't go themselves. On top of that, they won't allow others to go in. It's a terrible picture here. Double damnation. 14. Why don't you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites? If you devour widows' houses, and for pretense, make long prayer. Therefore, you shall receive the greater damnation. Back in the 1930s and 40s and 50s, if you were an Irishman and didn't go to church regularly, in fact, if you just missed one church service, the priest would come looking for you, and you'd be ostracized. And you'd be reprimanded, and you walked, you know, you walked in fear. You lived in fear that the priest would come and condemn you. In fact, I remember one old Irishman telling us that they thought the priests were God. They were terrified of the priest and priests in general. Fifteen again. Why don't you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites? If you come to see and land to make one proselyte, yep, they travel far and wide. And when he is made. You make them twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. The same is true of the cults. They're very good at coming along and trying to further explain the truth, quote-unquote, with the new Christian. And by the way, have you got the Awake magazine? By the way, have you got Doctrines and Covenants? Or by the way, have you looked at the Catholic Catechism, adding to the finished work of Christ? And the term proselyte is nothing to do with getting somebody saved. It's making someone religious which is not what this is all about. We want to get people saved, and as a result, introduce them into relationship with the Lord. Go to 2 Timothy, please. 2 Timothy, chapter 3. 2 Timothy, chapter 3. And don't get me wrong, I have no uh, animosity towards such people. Uh, they'll get their comeuppance when it pleases the Lord. Between now and then, I have a compassion for these people. I have no desire to condemn them. I want them to be saved. I want them to come to knowledge of the truth. And yet we're told to abuse them sharply. And there's many different ways to do that. Second Timothy chapter 3. Look at verse 1, please. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Very much the case today. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. That crowd from Sunday, and I've met those types of people before, offer themselves as being very religious, very upright, I'm a good member of society i work 50 hours a week i've raised four children very proud of that i'm a good family man i'm a pillar of the community i'm part of the rotary club i'm part of the catenians i'm a good freemason but verse three without natural affection they've got this unhealthy interest in children on top of that they neglect their children on top of that they are truce breakers also disobedient to parents unthankful unholy one of the biggest messes I ever saw over the years was this worship of Mary, watching the priest get the Eucharist, hold it up, and they'll go down their knees. That's an abomination. Men loving their own selves. You see these bodybuilders very much uh, worshipping their bodies, covetous, lusting after everyone and everything, boasters, proud, blasphemers, very much 
on the rise. Oh my, we hear it all the time, don't we? JC, we hear it all the time. And yet we never hear Muhammad blasphemed. We never hear Buddha blasphemed. We never hear prime ministers or presidents blasphemed. Trait is verse 4. In fact, we saw two guys at Speaker's Corner, which I think I mentioned last time, who were raised in, I guess, a Christian environment. I won't say a biblical environment, but a Christian environment, quote-unquote, who have now converted over to Islam. Very much a picture of treachery. Having a form of godliness. And they come across very pious, these people. I don't drink alcohol. I don't smoke. I don't do this. I don't do that. I don't eat meat. Well, good for you. But they deny the power thereof. They don't give credit to the Lord. For such, turn away. So what they are doing, in essence, is suppressing their flesh. Trying to keep it down. Not the way Paul speaks about over in 1 Corinthians 9, but through their own will, through their own ways. And as a result, other sins start to boil up, start to come to the surface. From such, turn away. You can't be in a relationship with such people. You can be friendly to some extent. You can be amicable to some extent. You can keep the door open to such people to some extent. But fellowship, no. Praying with them, no. And that's why the ecumenical movement is such an abomination. Apostate priests, apostate vicars, praying with Muslims, praying with Hindus, praying with folks who don't even know Jesus Christ, and telling us we're wrong to condemn them. They're the ones who are wrong to do it in the first place. Six, for this sort are they which creep into houses, and a captive city women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning, and never able to come to knowledge of the truth, being Jesus Christ, of course. Now as Janus and Jambus withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. You've got Moses coming along back in the Old Testament, a type of Christ, a picture of a righteous man, having the sign gifts, and you've got these two individuals withstanding Moses, trying to thwart the witness, like we saw on Sunday. Dozens upon dozens of Mohammedans withstanding our presence, trying to shout us down, trying to silence our mouths, trying to attack the gospel. So do these also resist the truth. Men and women of corrupt minds. Your heart is depraved, which is bad enough, but when your mind goes, when you've got a corrupt mind, you pass a point of no return. Reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. So you say to yourself, it's even worth trying to engage with such people, yes. Because some may get saved, but most will not get saved. Most, according to these verses, are earmarked for destruction. Most of these people are going to be damned. And if the truth be known, that is what they want. Turn to Jude, please. Jude, chapter 4. It's a great thing to be saved. It's a great thing to be kept saved. It's a great thing that our God loved us enough to die for us, to redeem us. And yet, what can Muhammad offer you? What can the Catholic Church offer you? They've got no atonement, they've got no saviour, they've got no assurance of salvation whatsoever. Jude 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turned the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, Jesus wasn't God. He didn't die on the cross. He was a good man, but he was a sinful man. How dare you say that? And you've got the right to say that. It's a free country. Paul came up against blasphemers throughout his life, as would Jesus. And on many occasions, they allowed such people to condemn themselves. And we can allow people to condemn themselves as well. I think the key is to not lose our temper when it comes to speaking to such people, to rise above the provocations, not to lower ourselves to their level. Look at verse 12, please. These are spots in your feasts of charity. When they feast with you, feed themselves without fear. Clouds, they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, Without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Terrifying. You've got a group of people 
that have been written about in scripture, which cannot be redeemed, very much like the angels that fell. This crowd cannot be redeemed. Did Christ die for them? Yes. But to the Lord's foreknowledge, he knew they wouldn't be redeemed. He knew they wouldn't want to be redeemed. And as a result, are going to be damned and take many to hell with them. And yet, it doesn't need to be that way. If man would just turn to the Saviour and be saved. I mean, if Saul of Tarsus could be saved. Anybody could be saved. But looking at these scriptures this morning, I'm very mindful to the fact that most are not going to make it. Second Peter chapter 2, and I will close. Second Peter chapter 2, uh, look at verse 12, please. But these, as natural brute beasts, may be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are, and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and hearts they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way, and are gone astray, fallen away of Balaam the son of Bosor, who had the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumbass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. Cursed children, covetous practices, forsaken in the right way, eyes full of adultery, natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speaking evil of the things that they understand not, and as a result shall utterly perish in their own corruption, deceiving while they feast with you. 17. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. Wells without water, twice dead, dead trees. 18. When they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure to the lust of the flesh. Through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. When somebody comes from a Christian background, so-called, and becomes a Muslim, and it goes back to being a Christian. They call that a retread or revert. And people do go back and forth. I don't quite understand this. Every so often I meet somebody who came from a Christian background, became a Muslim, and then goes back to being a Christian. And they sort of go back and forth, back and forth. I don't know why that is the case. And it's just possible that some of those guys on Sunday, that's Speaker's Corner, that have converted to Islam from so-called Christian backgrounds, may go back to such backgrounds. These verses give the impression that it's never the same again. Let's keep reading on, look at 19. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. So they will offer you liberty, but they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. You fallen from grace, what would Paul tell us over in Galatians 5? If any man gets circumcised, Christ profits you nothing. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness, than after they had known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. You think of people like Alistair Crowley, coming from a very upright religious background, turning from it, becoming this wicked magician, evil man. In fact, at the height of his infamy, he was referred to as the most wicked man alive. And I think one country even excluded him from their shores. He's raised in that environment. He goes to church regularly. He reads the Bible regularly. He memorizes the Bible better than I can. Turns from that, starts his whole new movement up, do as thou wilt, very much ahead of his time, and as a result, is forever damned. I think Vincent van Gogh was another one, came from a religious background, got involved with wickedness, and perished. 22 in our clothes. But it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog has turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to wallow in the mire. If you have any knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you stray from that knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and get caught up, tangled up, in any system, any 
ideology, any view outside of scripture, it's almost impossible for you to come back to the truth. Of course, if you're saved and you stray, that's a different thing altogether. But if you have a head knowledge of Christ and you depart from that head knowledge of Christ and get caught up with the Muslims, for example, or the cults or the occult or what have you, it's pretty clear from this piece of scripture that there's no way back. There's no second chance. And that term, dog, 22, we looked at that yesterday, picturing unsaved man and unsaved woman, a very derogatory term. On top of that, a sow, a female pig, <coughs> washing, returning to the mire. A picture there of a dog, a picture there of a pig. That's what God thinks of unsaved people, by the way. You're a dog, you're a pig. If you're a man, you're a dog. If you're a woman, you're a pig. Not very charming, I know, but this is a difficult subject. This isn't a pleasant subject to tackle, and that's why when we go into the streets as Bible believers, we have to be prepared to meet some pretty diverse people, pretty complicated people, pretty confused people, and yet not to allow such to pull us down, not allow such to take our joy from us, and at the same time to be mindful that we are in a spiritual war, a spiritual battle, and how most of those that we are speaking to are never going to be saved anyway, whether you're a Calvinist or not. And that goes back to my very first conversation with a young man when we first arrived here. Matthew seven, thirteen: the road to hell is wide, broad, the gate, the entrance to heaven is narrow, and few there be which will find it. So how you want to approach the atonement, few are going to make it, and yet that doesn't stop me trying to witness to people, trying to make a difference trying to get the word of God out. So I think you've had enough for today, and uh, we'll leave it there and uh, see what the Lord shows us for tomorrow.